Today, Darwinism is generally assumed throughout science and the academic world. Yet, despite its wide acceptance, a growing number of scientists and scholars, including those who met at Pajaro Dunes, now challenge key aspects of Darwinian theory. When we came together at Pajaro Dunes, we certainly didn't agree on everything, but we did share a real dissatisfaction with the mechanism of natural selection and the role that it was playing in biological explanation. Natural selection is a real process, and it works well for explaining certain limited kinds of variation, small-scale change. We have lots of examples of that, in fact. Where it doesn't work well is explaining what Darwin thought it could, namely the real complexity of life. We have the finch beak, and then you've got the finch itself, a minor change in the structure of the beak versus the origin of the organism itself. These are different scales of phenomena. These are different kinds of problems. And the important problem for biology is to understand where natural selection works and where it doesn't and why there's a difference. Evidence is very powerful, and all of us had the sense that if we let that evidence speak for itself, that it would lead us in a very different direction, away from natural selection and towards a different conclusion about the origin and nature of life on Earth. Natural selection acts only by taking advantage of slight successive variations. She can never take a great and sudden leap, but must advance by short and sure, though slow steps. It's really interesting to notice that the more we know about life and the more we know about biology, the more problems Darwinism has and the more design becomes apparent. Since 1988, Dr. Michael B. has investigated complex biological systems that seem to defy explanation by natural selection. For the longest time, I believe that Darwinian evolution explains what we saw in biology. Not because I saw how it could actually explain it, but because I was told that it did explain it. And in schools, I was taught Darwinian biology. And through college and graduate school, I was in an atmosphere which just assumed that Darwinian evolution explained biology. And again, I didn't have any reason to doubt it. It wasn't until about you know, 10 years or more ago that I read a book called Evolution, A Theory and Crisis by a, a geneticist by the na name of Michael Denton, an Australian. And he put forward a lot of scientific arguments against Darwinian theory that I had never heard before. And, and the arguments uh, seemed pretty convincing. And at that point, I, I started to get a bit angry because I, I thought I was being led down the primrose path. Here were a number of very good arguments, and I had gone through a, a doctoral program in biochemistry, became a faculty member, and uh, I had never even heard of these things. And so from that point on, I became very interested in, in the question of evolution and, and uh, since have decided that Darwinian uh, processes are not uh, the whole explanation for life. Michael Behe's skepticism derived in large measure from what modern biology has revealed about life's most fundamental unit, the cell. In the 19th century, when Darwin was alive, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. This perception didn't really change too much until the early 1950s. But in the last half century, our knowledge of the cell has just exploded. Today, powerful technologies reveal elaborate microscopic worlds. Worlds so small that a thimbleful of cultured liquid can contain more than four billion single-cell bacteria, each packed with circuits, assembly instructions, and miniature machines, the complexity of which Charles Darwin could never have imagined. At the very basis of life, where molecules and cells run the show, we've discovered machines. 
literally molecular machines. There are little molecular trucks that carry supplies from one end of the cell to the other. There are machines which capture the energy from sunlight and turn it into usable energy. There are as many molecular machines in the human body as there are functions that the body has to do. So if you think about hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, blood clotting, respiratory action, the immune response, all of those require a host of machines. When we look at these machines, we ask ourselves, where do they come from? And the standard answer, Darwinian evolution, uh, is very inadequate in, in my view. In speaking on the topic of scientific naturalism and evolution... During the early 1990s, at a series of academic conferences, Behe first shared his doubts about the ability of natural selection to construct complex molecular machines. One machine particularly attracted his attention. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising. For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward and reverse, water cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function. Um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. To see why, we must understand a feature of molecular machines known as irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell, all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system.